by the rest of our nation today. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, all that praise goes to the Lord. Pastor Bobby, we're just continuing this right on from where Pastor Johnson left off. No, it started at noon. No? It started at noon. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. Those of you online, I guess uh, you didn't get to hear that part. Those of you that are here did. Uh, Pastor asked me this week if I would share this Sunday. I had some things on my heart, and I told him I would, but I didn't tell you what I was going to share about. Did I, Pastor? That's right. No. What I'd like to share with you this morning is that the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm not, I'm not kidding. That's, that's what the Lord put on my heart. And uh, as Pastor got up to share the passion and zeal that he had, uh, praise the Lord. I just love it when he does that. Uh, the, the church I grew up in where my dad pastored, there would be Sunday school for 45 minutes. And oftentimes the pastors in training would... Uh, would deliver that Sunday school message. And I can't believe how many times <laughs> the sermon would just completely yeah, match the yeah. Sunday school message. So I think the Lord wants to, uh, to, to put this on our hearts this morning. Uh, this is what's been resonating with me, um, partly because I, I started a new class this week, and the name of the book that I'm reading is The Battle Belongs to the Lord. And uh, you can't help but have those, those insights and gleanings come and uh, be a part of your thoughts in your message. So let's just go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today, Lord, as we look into your word, that you are the God uh, of Abraham and of Isaac, Lord God, of Jacob and of Joseph. And Lord, you are our God this morning. And Father, I thank you that as we look back into your word thousands and thousands of years ago, Lord, we celebrate this morning that we are serving the same God that these men serve. And Lord, just as you were faithful to them, you have promised to be faithful to us, Lord. Yes, yes. Lord, there is no temptation that is common to man. Yes. Lord, but we've seen that which is common to man. And Jesus has experienced all that is common to man. And Lord, this morning as the song came out, the stone's been rolled away and Jesus has gone before us. And Lord, may you remind us this morning through this word and the words that have already come out that the battle belongs to you, Lord. We're in this battle, but we know, Lord, that it belongs to you. We thank you, and I pray that your spirit would move in this word, Lord God, and the words that are spoken would be spirit and life, and it would be from your throne. Yes. Ask this in the name of your precious yes. Son, Jesus. Amen. 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 So I, as I was waiting on the Lord about this message, so many thoughts came, and I, I even thought to myself, okay, I could, I could enter this message from about eight different portals. Where's going to Where's my starting point going to be? Because this is not a, a passage, uh, expositional sermon. And I'm thinking so much about the grace of God. Because we are here this morning because of the grace of God. And more and more and more, I just keep yes. Yes. meditating on the grace of God. And it is such a wonderful place to be. I've said of all the amazing truths and things I've studied at the seminary level... That the greatest takeaway that I've had from that experience has been the grace of God in my life yeah. and in your life to both save us, but even more than yeah. saving us to keep us. And how many know we have to be kept? Amen. So I'm thinking on that song, Amazing Grace. I'm thinking through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Now, what I may perceive as a danger and a toil and a snare, you might say, oh, that's nothing. <laughs> I could handle that no problem at all. Perhaps because you, you've walked through those places and the Lord has strengthened you and enabled you. But for someone else who hasn't walked through those places, that could be quite a challenging circumstance. And so right. as I think back over the last 10 years of my life, particularly as it relates to me going overseas for ministry trips, I think about where the Lord has brought me from to get me to where I stand here this morning. And my heart is just overwhelmed. So many times you hit the wall, and we do hit the wall. And I'm going to talk about that this morning. I'm going to talk about a lot of different things, and I'm going to weave it through. But the message this morning is that the battle belongs to the Lord. Now, Mark Batterson, who's a Christian writer, recently published a book and one of his points in there 
is that if you want God to do the supernatural, you have to do the natural. Now, as Pentecostals, we could potentially pick that statement apart, but, and that's a Pentecostal who wrote that statement, there is a lot of truth to that. Um, when the children of Israel marched around Jericho, they had to be obedient to what God asked them to do. They had to do the marching and the being silent. They had to listen to what God wanted them to do, and then at the end, God did all the work. And oftentimes in our lives, we have to do the natural, and we have to overcome. And God's going to meet that with the supernatural, with the grace that we need to enable us to do that and to overcome. Now, we are humans. We, uh, we live in a world, in a fallen world, where there's sickness, where there's evil, where there's wickedness, where there are dangers, toils, and snares at every turn. And oftentimes, these will... Uh, they, they will collect and become a big storm, what we refer to as a storm in our lives. And sometimes we're in those storms individually, and sometimes we're in these things together. We're in this pandemic together right now, and we're all experiencing the effects of that to one degree or another. Some people have lost their job because of the pandemic, and that's a greater hardship to them than for those of us that still have a steady continual income. We all have to deal with these, and we're all pretty much tired of having to deal with these, and it's not getting any easier. And so, as we go through these things, by God's grace, we have to overcome. You had to overcome to be here this morning. My wife said to me about 10 o'clock, you know, they, the roads are bad, okay? They closed 79 down between Saltwell and uh, South Fairmont, and they closed 73 down too, which would be the bypass. So where do you think all that traffic went? Right. Off of Route 50 on to 250. So I'm headed down to church this morning. Here comes semi after semi around. And they're over the line. And all of these things, well, that's just life. It is just life. But sometimes these things just culminate. You know, the devil uses them as a distraction to get you off your game. And you have to be aware. You got to be aware. Jesus came to them in the garden and he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And when our flesh gets weak, we get downcast and we get discouraged. And we have to ask ourselves, do I need to follow the advice of the Apostle Paul right now, where Paul says, I beat my body into subjection to make it obedient to the will of God? Or do we say, you know what, I've run my body hard enough for a while. I need to use good common sense here, and I need to get some rest. And... There's a fine line in between the two. It's very important that we take care of ourselves. I have prioritized exercise in my life because I've learned how important it is for me to be effectively healthy and equipped to be able to do the will of God. And therefore, I make it a big priority in my week. If I can meet it, I'm going to meet it. Uh, and a lot of times, this is just a, a mental thing. I was invited to a, uh, a men's prayer breakfast on Friday in Washington at 7 a.m. And I said to my wife the night before, I've already driven up there four days this week. I said, I can't imagine having to get in the car and drive back up there again tomorrow morning. And I didn't need to be there until 8.30. But I have been persistently hounded to go to this prayer breakfast. So the Lord woke me up, I guess, around 4 to 5. I got up. I, I exercised for half an hour. And then got ready and then drove up there and, and still went and did all that. And physically it wore me out. But those were things looking at the day. By your grace, I'm going to do this. I'm going to trust you to meet me even though my body's tired. Because the, the spirit is willing. The spirit as well. And there's there's some good things that are going to come out from that. I'll share that with you more in the future. Now, about 10 years ago, I don't know if I told you this story. Um, 2000, yeah, 2011, almost 10 years ago, when the Lord had called me from Washington back down to Fairmont, I had uh, contracted to build a house in Fairmont. And I had four months to build it and four months to sell the house that I already had. With the plan that if the Lord didn't come through, according to my ideas, how many knows he always comes through? Yeah. If he didn't come through according to my ideas, then I had a backup plan. Amen. Which was, when I had to sign for that house and pay for it, I still had another house payment that I had to pay for. Well, 
For whatever reason, the Lord chose not to allow that first house to sell. And come September uh, of 2010, I was sitting in um, a predicament where I could either have breached the, the contract for my new house and gone back to Washington and said, well, you know, the Lord didn't come through for me, therefore I'm out of this thing. Or I could have pressed forward. I chose to press forward. I ended up under two large mortgage payments. Um, and I'd like to tell you that things got better, but that happened to be a season in my life where I had just started pastoring my first church in Fairmont. And uh, I was working full time. My family and I were living in, in separate places. We were navigating that. And it went on for months and months. Not only that, there were issues with the old house that were popping up that were um, expensive. And as I was carrying it, the, uh, the HVAC system died, and I had to replace that. Mm -hmm. Plus, there were issues with the new house, a lot of issues. And this thing went on and on and on to where a year later in, in 2011, in September, I was sitting there in my office just completely wrung up and overwhelmed. I've been carrying this thing for a year now. This was my battle. This wasn't a pandemic. People were not in this with me, except for the fact that my family was going through it with me. Uh, financially, we were really, really hemorrhaging money. And I knew that the Lord could sell this home in an instant. I knew he could. All he had to do was speak the word, and this home was sold. But it wasn't happening. So here I am, uh, 16, 16 months after I put that house up for sale in Washington, that people told me this house is going to go in two weeks. You are going to make so much money on this house. The bank was sitting there stunned. Why is this house not selling? Anyway, I was at a pretty low point in September. This thing had worn me down. And I had an opportunity to go overseas to, uh, to Bulgaria with my dad on a, on a ministry trip. And I had never been overseas. And I felt the Lord impress that upon me to go. And I bought the plane ticket. And um, that was back when that uh, hurricane, I think it was Hurricane Lee, was coming up from Texas. And we had colossal rains. And there's water pouring over the foundation of my new house and coming in through the, the walls and just trouble, trouble, trouble mounting. And I said to myself, I'm going. I, I, I don't care what happens. I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to go. And I did. And at the time, I was carrying two phones, one for the uh, office and one for my personal life. I was used to having these things on vibrate. And they, it would vibrate. This is back in the Blackberry days. It vibrate all the time. I put all that stuff in the trunk of my car, and I took off to Bulgaria. <laughs> no communication unless I would go into some cafe and I could get on the Internet for a few minutes just to contact home. And it's like... It's almost like being on the ground and dealing with the rain and the storms and everything else that's going on. And then you lift off in that jet and that jet takes off above the clouds and you transcend the reality that's on the ground. Mm -hmm. You transcend that and you're above the clouds and you're riding above the clouds. Mm -hmm. And that's how eagles get up there. They fly into the storm and they rise above the storm. So you're up there, and all of a sudden, all the stuff in America just fades away. It's still there, but it's just like it disappeared. And I'm over there in a different realm for a while. And how many know it's still God's realm? How many of God grafted is the God of Bulgaria? I'm overseas serving God for a season, for a specific time. And I was being refreshed over there. The Lord was giving me a viewpoint that I couldn't get when I'm sitting in what I like to call our sandboxes. Mm -hmm. There are people who don't want to leave Grafton. They don't want to leave Fairmont. They don't want to leave Pittsburgh, PA. That's their little sandbox. And a lot of times they don't want to leave for one main word. You know what that word is? Fear. Fear. They don't want to go because of fear. And oftentimes fear holds us back from doing what God has called us to do. By the grace of God, I go on that plane and I got just some, some life-changing perspective that was so beneficial. You know, I got back from that trip in early October, and I think within a week of getting back, I got a phone call from the realtor in the house sold. And a couple weeks later, I closed on it, and it was history. It was a storm in my life. Yeah. It was a forming place. Mm -hmm. And that one was primarily financial. I mean, that, that hit me. That God had to teach me lessons there of faith in the financial realm. 
I had to overcome to do that. I could have just as easily said, you know what, I'm staying in the sandbox. I'm staying here, God. I'm not going. It's, it's too much. But God, by his grace, equips us. If he calls us, he equips us to overcome. And we have to overcome. So fast forward about six years to 2017, I was going through another crisis. Uh, I had hit a, a major uh, crisis at my church in Fairmont. And I won't go into the details of what happened, but a lot of things that were brewing in that church that were creating conflict and trouble came to a head and forced us to deal with it. And I knew that, I knew that we were in a predicament. And about a week or two later, I had the opportunity to go to Kenya again with my dad. And uh, I didn't think about it too long. I prayed about it, and the Lord uh, pressed it upon my heart. And I told the church, I'm, I'm going to Kenya for two weeks. And uh, got on the plane, and put the battle belongs to the Lord. The church belongs to the Lord. I'm not running away from the church. But I've got people there to take care of it right now. This is where the Lord's called me. So we got to Kenya, and uh, these are these are things that the Lord brings to you along the way that becomes just truly gems. And it happened to be that weekend that we were having a, an ordination service for the pastors. Now this is for new pastors. This is the work of God. This is ordaining men to the ministry. And while I was there, the next morning we had um, we had a special service as well, and the bishop. Of the church there, his name is Joseph Matula. You haven't met him. Uh, unveiled a plan for a new building. Now, over in Kenya, their buildings are generally made out of corrugated tin and beams. And a lot of times, these beams are just some tree they knock down <laughs> real close and they tie them together and throw some corrugated tin up. And uh, generally, they'll have a peat gravel floor with some stackable chairs. And if they're uh, a little better off financially, they'll put down ceramic dial and everything. Um, and I, I have a picture of that. So Bobby, if you, you have those pictures handy. So if you can load the one that says um, uh, the architect building or the proposed building. So the bishop that morning unveiled his plans to build a new church. Is that gonna load? And as he showed this building to us, I thought, oh my goodness, that thing is marvelous. Uh, you know, in the States, that building would be expensive. And he said to us, the architect's estimation was $550,000. And I said, well, I know a lot of churches in America whose building funds might be $100,000. A quarter million is a lot to ask for, right? I mean, you start a building project, uh, are, are those gonna load okay, Father? Okay, all right, so I don't, don't know how well you can see this, but um, this is the proposed building. It's gonna be two floors, and uh, is there any way to enlarge that so it'll fill the screen? Anyway, it's, it's quite a building, and I sat there as the bishop started to ask for, for money to, uh, to help start the project. Now, you call it seed money, but I like to use that term sometimes. Not that you send me your seed uh, of $1,000 and God's going to, to play. I, I don't like that. But I do like bringing your offering. And, and, I, and I gave some this week to a ministry. And I said, here's, here's some seed money that I believe God's going to grow this money with other money in faith. That's, that's what we're talking about. So some people came together, and I don't know how much was raised that morning in that meeting. And they got enough to take the first step, which was to bring in the stone. Now, fast forward four years, they've been working on this thing. They've been doing the natural, getting the money, getting the materials, and God's been doing the supernatural. And I'm here to tell you that the building is completed. It's done. And as I think about being there that morning, that was the vision. But that vision was not yet reality. Here we are four years later. This was March of 2017 when I went over. The vision has become reality. A lot of people in this earth overcame by doing the natural. 
by, by lugging mortar, by, by lugging loads of stone and everything that goes into building. Yeah. You know, if you look back at Nehemiah, and uh, my brother-in-law pointed this out to me one time, when they were building the wall, it talks about each person doing their part. And, and in there, there's a, there's a verse that says, and Baruch, Baruch earnestly repaired his portion of the wall. So we can get in there with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, the Spirit of Christ, as the Holy Spirit ignites that in us, and we can earnestly work for the Lord. We can work toward the things that the Lord has called us to. And there's going to be opposition along the way. They had to work with one hand and carry a weapon with the other. Along the way, the enemy was calling the Nehemiah saying, come down, I want to talk to you. He said, I can't come down, I am doing a great work. We have to be able to overcome these distractions and the things that are coming against us. What did you have to overcome to get here this morning? Yeah. What did you have to overcome to get here last week? Yeah. What have you had to overcome in the past year of just natural things in life? Toils and dangers and snares <clears throat> that weigh us down. Yeah. Sickness. Maybe you had to recover from COVID. Maybe a lot of different things have happened. But to get us to this point. And so it said Baruch earnestly repaired his portion of the wall. And so the people put their hands to the work because it was a good work. Amen. And I'm here to tell you this morning that it's done, and not only is it done, but it's paid for. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to think of the other uh, pictures that I gave you, Bobby. There, uh, maybe show a picture of building one and building two. Okay, can we increase that at all? All right, so this is the inside of the building. It's hard to see from the picture, but uh, okay, you can back up to that last one. Yeah, right there. So this is the Sunday morning in March 2017, actually the Saturday afternoon when we were having a pastor's conference there. These, this represents men who've come in from Uganda, who've come in from Kenya, who've come in from Tanzania, all clustered together in Eastern Africa. But more than that, it represents the community of God. It represents the brothers and sisters of the Lord on the other side of the world. And it makes you realize we are but a drop in the bucket. We're just pawns in the kingdom of God and the work of God that he's doing. We've got a work going on here in Grafton. God's doing this thing on the other side of the world. When you get together with them, we're all part of that community. Yes. So reading about that this week in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together, the community. We are in Christ because of an alien righteousness. What do you mean by that? It is a righteousness that is apart from us. Paul talks about that in Philippians. Having a righteousness that is not my own. We have a righteousness that was paid for us because the stone's been rolled away. Because Jesus paid the price on the cross. Because he died. Because he was resurrected and he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. And his righteousness becomes our righteousness at faith, at salvation. So we have this righteousness that is alien to us. It's not something we originated in ourselves. But beyond that, you as a brother or sister in Christ have this same righteousness. And so what this morning is the basis for our fellowship? Is it the good coffee here? Is it the donuts that we have here? Well, we could do those things, and we've done those things in the past. But this morning, the basis of our fellowship is what Christ has done in your heart. Amen. What Christ has done in my heart. And then we are all part of the community of Christ. We are going to become part of the cloud of witnesses of the saints who have gone before us. Of Jehoshaphat, of David, of Daniel, of Abraham, of Joseph, of the saints who have persevered. The saints who have overcome. And we are here today persevering and overcoming as the cloud of witnesses cheers on. Come on, come on, come on. I woke up this morning and remembered that it was the Super Bowl Sunday. I could have cared less. I could have completely cared less. This has no bearing on my life today because things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. These are where I'm focused today. This is where I'm investing my energy today. I can go home tonight, I can watch that game, and I can throw a party. And I don't know, we can start probably at 3 and probably go until 8 o'clock and pick a team and invest in that team and find out at 11 o'clock that team loses. And what happens to my last eight hours? It was a, uh, I'll call a foolish exchange. <laughs> That'd be a foolish exchange. And uh, 
And Indiana Jones, he goes to get the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. And the wise knight says, choose wisely. Yeah. <laughs> You've chosen poorly. Mm -hmm. You've chosen foolishly. We have to do that with our time. Yeah. We have to do that with our time. We have to choose wisely. So if we can go back to those other pictures, Bobby. So this is the inside of the sanctuary that is done. These other pictures. I don't know how many this is going to seat. And then there's another one too, Bobby. I think it's a video. It'll show a little bit of it from the outside. This building is going to be dedicated next Sunday on Valentine's Day, the 14th. And what I'm about to share with you, I think I can share because my, my father has shared this himself here before because this is not my story. This is in many ways his, but I was there along the journey to witness it. Um, they are going to dedicate this building in his honor on Sunday. As I stand here this morning, this represents the culmination of not just four years of a vision that has become reality. This also represents the culmination of the grace of God in my life, in your lives. <coughs> In the life of my father, because God's grace touched him one day and called him out of the business world and called him into the ministry. And as a result of that, I came to know the Lord. And as a result of that, he has been faithful to follow the call of God in his life. He has been here to minister before. He has sown the riches of God into your life. He has sown the riches of God into my life. And as I see this, he actually tried to talk me out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go there by the grace of God this week. I'm going to this dedication. He tried to talk me out of going for a number of different reasons. And I said to him, this is a big honor. Not necessarily for your sake, but this represents the glory of God. Amen. This represents the grace and the glory of God in the life of an individual who came from a, uh, a different religious faith, a different denominational background. And it prophesied over him at one point that he would minister on foreign soil. And very much like Sarah with Abraham, he laughed in his heart. And he said, and he's told you this before. He says, that's not going to happen because I'm not going to get on an airplane. Mm -hmm. My dad also is not real fond of these masks, as none of us are right now either. So in order for him to go on this trip, and they said they were going to wait until he came to dedicate this building. He has to go through COVID testing. He has to overcome the things. And now as I've jumped on to travel, traveling overseas, there's a you know a few hoops you've got to jump through to begin with, and you have to get them right or you don't go. When you add COVID in on top of it, it creates more things that you have to overcome. We used to be able to land in Nairobi and just fill out our visas right at the airport and be on our way. This stuff all has to be done in advance. They, they had to get COVID tests on Monday before they left. They have to be done within a certain period of time. And they went to get on the plane on Thursday morning in Pittsburgh, and they wouldn't let them on the plane because the COVID tests they had were going to expire while they were in the air on the way to the Netherlands. And so you, you think that you've captured all of these details that you have to do, only to find out that you missed something, and they had to go back and get another COVID test, and they had to wait for the next day. He said it would be a miracle if he actually makes it to Nairobi. So he's in Nairobi now, praise the Lord. By God's grace, I'm going to get down on Wednesday as well because I want to be a part of this thing. But it's just one little piece of what's going on for the kingdom of the Lord. Now this whole battle, everything that's part of it, this battle belongs to the Lord. But we have a part in this battle that we have to play. And there were times in the last couple of days that I feel that I should go we're having to prepare and everything else on top of a schedule that is already extremely, extremely busy. And I knew I was physically wearing myself out. I knew that if I continued under this pace, I'm going to land in bed again for, for a couple weeks simply because my health is not going to take it. But I, I'm trusting the Lord and taking a step out of faith that he's going to sustain me to get me through this week to be able to be there on Friday and Saturday at this pastor's conference that we're going to be at on Saturday, and at this dedication on Sunday. Now, this is not just a church building on Sunday. The ministry that my dad is part of is called Building for the Future. 
and the bishop of this church in Nairobi is on the board of this ministry and this is actually the East Africa division I guess you would call or branch of building for the future ministries so this church represents not just a church but a Bible school and it represents classrooms and offices that become in some ways the administrative area of the East Africa portion of building for the future ministries now that is the result of I don't know 45 years of faithfulness on the part of my father but something had to happen first the grace of God had to touch his life the grace of God had to equip him to respond to the call of God in his life to leave the business world to launch out into the deep to go out into the unknown and as a result of me growing up underneath of that and watching him and my mother and, and all of the wonderful men and women of God that I was exposed to in my youth who were missionaries and I heard their stories about overcoming and going to Peru and everything else the Lord equipped me to respond by the grace of God and so when we look at this building that we're going to dedicate on Sunday I wanted to celebrate that with you here this morning and share that with you that that is that bishop oversees 110 churches. There are ministries in Uganda, ministries in Tanzania that all come out from this. And this is the Lord's doing, as they say. And it is marvelous in our eyes. But there is a lot of overcoming that has to occur to get that point. We have to continue to be faithful. We have to continue to plod on, plod on as the Lord leads us on in Him. So I want to bring this see if I've, if I've covered this so that I was telling pastor this week that, that I'm going to Kenya and uh, I wasn't planning to go just in the last week the Lord's really impressed upon my heart that it's an important thing I need to be there and um, I jumped through a lot of hoops to get there and I uh, occasionally I thought well you know is this even worth it but we have to decide when the enemy's coming against us with an attack even from the very closest people to us and who are well-meaning very well-meaning who are looking out for our health or looking out for this or saying you know I I don't know if you should do this and we got got to get alone with the Lord and we have to figure out Lord what are you saying if he's telling us to go we have to overcome let me shift gears here for a minute These are things that I've that I've heard this week and I'm personally experiencing, and many of you are probably experiencing this too as we approach mid-February. We dealt with this winter and the absence of our friend the sun. Not, not Jesus, the sun, but the sunshine, and the gloom and the yuck, and the icy roads, and the tractor trailers, and everything else we have to deal with. The pandemic the sickness and it all wears it all wears on us let me know that in order for you to function properly you have to get rest god's ordained that we need rest in fact he went so far as to say he didn't create the man for the sabbath he created the sabbath for the man because he knows that we need rest he's built that into our lives we need to eat we need to drink these are all physical things. So what makes us think that we can run and run and run and run without sleep and without proper nutrition and without taking care of ourselves and be able to continue to run apart from the grace of the Lord? This stuff will wear our bodies out. Some of this stuff is natural, it's scientific, and it doesn't contradict the Bible. We know the Lord can overcome. So this was an article that I, that I came across this week about the uh, just written a couple days ago about the pandemic um, causing us to hit a wall. And I just read a little bit of this. Within the past couple of weeks, many of us have been slammed with major pandemic fatigue. You might be feeling this this morning. This is the real thing. We're burned out, okay? We're expected to be productive at work or to parent or often both as though we haven't been living in hell for the last year. The winter has been bleak and could potentially get bleaker. We've got an election and everything led up to that election on top of all of this. 
And even though the vaccines are bringing us the much needed hope, our feelings of exhaustion and hopelessness are swallowing up any positive emotions whole. It makes sense. We've been at this for a year now in our fight or flight system. The emotional reaction to stress that's been otherwise energizing us through the pandemic is totally overloaded. And when that happens, the constant flow of, adre of adrenaline starts to drain and apathy settles in, okay? Well, that's natural. That's that scientific, that's like sleeping and eating. It seems that we've gone over that tipping point, feeling emotionally zapped, especially in this stage of the coronavirus crisis is very normal, mental health experts say. When our fight or flight system has been totally overworked, uh, even little things that might not have bothered us before um, can get to us, uh, explain a licensed mental health person. I, I know when I hit my weakness, uh, when, when I get mentally and physically tired, I, I, I get a little bit snappy. I hate it, but it's part of the fact that I'm human and that uh, that just happens. I, I've often said to a pastor in Haiti who's invited me to come where the low temperature is 90 degrees, Pastor, I'm afraid that if I came there, you wouldn't even think I was safe because I would lose my sanctification. <laughs> because <laughs> apart from the grace of God, and I mean an immense measure of the grace of God, I will be so overcome by that temperature. That I won't exhibit any indications of being a sanctified believer. Therefore, I need a thus saith the Lord if I'm coming to Haiti. I'm willing that God make me able. Okay, so this is just this is just reality. And some people have a greater breaking point than other people do. And we all know where that breaking point is. Now, that's that, that's the scientific thing about our bodies. What does the word say about that? Well, without going into the scriptures, let's throw out a couple illustrations. Elijah, after having probably his adrenal glands burned out, he's been through this major, major thing up on Mount Carmel where the battle belonged to the Lord. He calls down fire from heaven, and you know the story. Everything that happened, they slay the prophets of Baal, and Elijah's walking off this mountain with this victory, and the next thing we know, you know, Jezebel has threatened his life, and he's just, that's it. And you say, how did that great man Elijah get from that point to that point? And first of all, he's a man. He not, doesn't have a supernatural body. He's a man. He's tired. He's coming down off of a major, major victory. And oftentimes that's where the enemy's going to hit you. And what would just be commonplace and we'd run right by it now can, can really, really get to us. I'll notice my reaction to certain things. Like this week when I'm just absolutely mentally and physically exhausted, I say under normal circumstances that wouldn't bother me, I'd go right by it. But it's just, it's that, it's that straw that breaks the camel's back. So we're all there. We're all feeling this in different ways. Uh, on, on the radio this week, they said that the CDC just announced that mental health illness, as indicated by visits to the emergency department in kids from 5 years old to 11 years old, was up 24% last year over the previous year. This is 5 to 11 year olds. And kids from 12 to 17 up 31%. This is where I'm, and those of us who have been on this world for a while know that we've got more years behind us than ahead of us. We see the world differently than a kid who's looking forward to hope, looking forward to dreams and everything else. And gosh, what's this world that I'm living in like? I, I watched the politicians argue like two, you know, two little kids on a school playground one day. And these are our leaders. I've heard the kids say this. I couldn't even watch it. These are the people who are supposed to be leading us. So we're in the middle of this. And this brings me back to the verse in Daniel where it says, and he's, uh, he shall think to wear out the saints of the Most High. Okay? That's where we are. So we're living in the midst of this. So what does the Bible say about this? Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Well, what's tribulation mean, Jesus? I think it encompasses all the things that we're dealing with here in a fallen world. And right now, we happen to be in this season. Yeah. And we're in it together. That's, you know, some 40 hours of travel to get from Pittsburgh over to Kenya. And my dad has to be in a mask the entire time. I haven't talked to him yet to see how well he did with that. But that's something that he has to overcome. So we're all dealing with this here this morning. 
Now, I had people that I told, you know, I'm getting ready to go to Africa, and these are probably unbelievers. Like, what? Haven't you heard there's another strain of COVID over there? Haven't you heard this? Haven't you heard that? Haven't you heard that the Lord's going to take your master today? I heard. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. I know that these risks exist. So it sounds like I'm bouncing around to a couple different places, but I'm not. I'm drawing on different portions of the word that we need to draw on as we're waiting upon the Lord and we're renewing our strength and our spirits are being re-energized yes, in the spirit. It says in Revelation, they overcame him. Who? The devil. The accuser of the brethren that accused the brethren day and night. Mm -hmm. We may not be there at God's point in history, but the devil also has a spirit of Antichrist, which is alive and well in the world today. Yeah. And we know he's been alive and well in the world since the time of John, since the time of Christ. The spirit of Antichrist, and I think we can all agree with watching with our eyes, this spirit is alive and well. How are we going to overcome these things? And by the way, I'm here to tell you, go, go look in the book of Revelation. Look it up. Jesus says, to him that overcometh will I give. To him that overcometh will I give. It's seven times in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. And then once again at the end of the book. To him or to her that overcomes will I give. Amen. I sat there yesterday and I had the option to cancel my airfare. And I had people... Very loving people coming to me. I don't think this is a good idea. People that are closest to me telling me that. And I had to sit before the Lord and go, okay, Lord, what do you want? I can think of situations where people have taken one response. And I think of C.T. Studd, right or wrong, as you judge his life, who went against doctor's orders, his wife's orders, and in a physical wreck at 50 years old, went to the Congo and pioneered the heart of Africa ministry. Mission, ministry. Only saw his wife once in the last 16 years of his life. Well, he's going to stand before our righteous king and judge and give an account. And we don't know what Jesus is going to say, but he certainly has the treasure and the fruit that he sent on to heaven. And so as we go through these things, the Bible promises us that we can be overcomers. Yes. It promises us that we can be overcomers. And as that we move forward in the Lord, we can overcome. And how do we do that? So our adrenal glands are burned out. So these other things are happening. We go before the Lord with the power of prayer. Lord, this is what science says. This is what natural laws in this world say. But you are greater than that. You can overcome that in my life as I come before you and as I wait on you and I renew my strength. I was traveling home from work one night this week, just completely tired. It's dark. The roads are messy and worn out. Put on some, some worship music and I feel my spirit being rejuvenated. As you were talking about this morning, Paul, as, as we worship the Lord, feel that life coming back to my spirit. Okay, let's keep plodding on, plodding on until the vision that we have, until the vision that the Lord has given to us becomes our reality. Until we lay hold in reality of that which the Lord has spoken to us, maybe in our prayer closet. Or maybe when he laid hands on us in a service down here. And the prophet says, you are going to preach on foreign soil. And the man says, that's no way is that going to happen because I'm not going to fly. And then the vision, fast forward 40 some years later, the man's preached on foreign soil. I don't know how many times. And that building that's going up is in large part due to his faithfulness in following the call of God. That's not to give glory to him, as I'm going to close here real soon, we're going to see. That's to give all of the glory to God. I don't know, you know, when you get to heaven, I'm going to be honest with you, and I don't know, this might be offensive to some people. I don't want a gold mansion. I don't. I don't. I don't want a crown. I'm being honest with you. I'm not trying to be humble up here. I don't. I don't care. I want to see Jesus. That's, right. That's it. I just want to be an ambassador of Christ. Amen. Given the ministry of reconciliation, I just want to be there with Jesus and my brothers and sisters. Right. I don't care where I stay. I don't care if I have a heart. I don't care about any of that. Mm -hmm. I want to be there where the life of God is 
with brothers and sisters of like precious faith. It's just how it is. The crowns, they cast them back at Jesus' feet anyway. But we didn't earn them. The grace of God did all that through us. I've learned that. I used to think it was part of who I was. Now I'm realizing, God, you, you, by your grace, you have equipped me to do everything that I've done in this program of ministry. So as we close here this morning, I'm going to get to my text. <laughs> let's go to let's go to First Samuel chapter one, and, and don't worry, I'll go through this in hopefully five minutes. First Samuel chapter one and verse seventeen. Another very well known story in the Old Testament. This is what we teach the kids in Sunday school: David and the giant. David and the giant. It's really, you know, about the grace of God. The story is about overcoming. The story is about the glory of God. And let's just jump ahead up to verse, um, oh, let's see here. What's that? Isn't it 2 Samuel? No, I have 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 40. 17. We go to verse 40, and he took, he, David took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even a script. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou come to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Now, as I'm thinking about this story, I picture David being, um, he's, he's a young boy, a teenager. I don't think he was very big. It says, you know, he was, he was considered the least of all of his brethren. But you know the story. God didn't look upon that. God looked upon the heart. And Goliath, you know, I think, I don't know exactly what Goliath looked like, but if you think of Dwayne Johnson, the rock, you know, this guy that eats, I don't know how many pounds of cod a day, this guy's a specimen. And Goliath was probably like a big Dwayne Johnson standing out there. You know, I don't know that David was real muscular, but he's coming up there, and you're looking at this thing, and the guys are passing around the cash, you know, ringside, and taking bets on who's going to win this thing. My money's on Goliath. And everyone's betting on Goliath. But David, David's coming at this thing from a different angle. Where are the Israelites? Where's the king? Hunkered down in what? Fear. Hunkered down in fear and uncertainty. And here's how David approached it. In verse 45, and David said to the Philistine, you come at me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. That's all reality. That's what Goliath was carrying. Not only that, you know, a well-trained machine of warfare. He'd been a warrior since his youth. He was a skilled warrior. David's a shepherd. He's taking care of sheep. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. That's it right there. Amen. You defied the name of my God. Fight it. And that's not okay in my book. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite you, and I will take your head from you, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with a sword, and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it into your hands. David, as we know, was not equipped to fight this battle. But he, you know, the three things, he noted that Goliath defied the name of the Lord. He noted that it was the Lord who was going to bring the salvation. The Lord was going to do it through his hand, and he does the same thing in our lives. And at the end of the battle, the glory would go to the Lord. It's a common thread all through the Old Testament. It's a common thread in the Jehoshaphat incident that you mentioned this morning. The glory will go to the Lord. 
And it says later on in that passage that when the things start, you ever notice how, you know, they, they, they hit the bell for a ringside fight and some of the fighters are, you know, they're, they're, they're jogging around and backing off and trying to, to get out of the way. It says David ran to the battle. And I think Keith Green has a song called Run to the Battle. And that's what the Lord wants to do with us. He wants us to run to the battle. And as the message, the word has come out this morning, we have to be reminded that the battle is the Lord's. But I want to say that we have a part of that. We have to be overcomers. We have to press on, recognizing that the battle belongs to the Lord. Lord, I'll do my part in the natural. I'll do what you've called me to do. I'll go buy that piece of property. I'll get a hammer. I'll start to build that church. I'll get on a plane to go over here. I'll make all the arrangements. That I have to be in a certain place, trusting that when I get there and through there, that the battle belongs to you, to you, and that you're going to make a way. And somehow, some way, Lord, you're going to sustain me, and you're going to get me through this thing. And at the end of the day, we cast all of our crowns back to you, and all of the glory goes to you, Lord. And in that, it says, you know, the, one guy was saying. Would God have come through against this Philistine if David hadn't gone out and approached him and decided to go to war against him? Now, he might have. He might not have. Could God do it? Could God wipe out them? You know, just like he did with Sennacherib, send 180, uh, an angel of death and 185,000 fall that night? Yeah. But here's the beauty of the story with David. God gave David the privilege of being used in that battle. Do you know that God, as, as ambassadors of Christ, God gives us the privilege of being used in his kingdom. Right. When we're weak, when we're wrung out, when we're tired, we say, Lord, I can't go on anymore. God says, you can go on. And, and the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. Paul wrote, my grace is sufficient. Jesus said to the overcomers, will I give? And the word that's living and active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to divide soul and spirit speaks to our heart. And it says, these might be the facts. You might be experiencing pandemic fatigue. Your adrenal glands might be burned out. You might be tired and worn out underneath of all this uncertainty. Your house hasn't sold for 16 months. It's never going to sell. You're going to sink financially. Your health is going to sink. The enemy is speaking to you. You say, all of that may be the facts, but the truth is, my God can overcome this thing in a matter of seconds by the word of his mouth. The word of his mouth. And so we need to be reminded of that. And not only do we need to be reminded of that, but we need to remind one another. We need to provoke one another to good works. We need to overcome to the best of our ability. As we overcome, we recognize that the battle belongs to the Lord. We're tired, we're worn out, and we ask God for his grace to get us through. Not only to get us through, but to lift us up that we're able to run to the battle, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning, Lord. And Lord, we recognize the reality of this time that we're in, that many people are worn out, Lord, that the Many of the saints are worn out. But Father, I pray during this time that you would give your people and your church, Lord, a measure of extra grace, Lord, and strength. Strengthen your church this morning, Lord God. Equip us, Lord, and encourage us. Lord, I pray for those that are watching online right now, that you would reach out by your spirit and encourage, Lord. Let the words that were spoken this morning, in whatever fashion, Lord, if it's only one verse or one sentence, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, let that word go through and begin to do its work to get the places in people's lives, Lord, that only the word can get to through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you brought us this far by your grace, Lord. And we stand here believing this morning, Lord, that you're going to carry us home. Lord, you brought us through dangers and toils and snares. And it's by your grace we've come this far. And we thank you this morning. Let us remember that the battle indeed belongs to the Lord. Lord, and it, we have the privilege of being used by you during this time, during this season, during this present age, Lord God. That you have given us this privilege of being a part of your kingdom. 
Lord, you could do all of these things without us, but you choose to use us. You've called us in our weaknesses and in our frailties, Lord, that your strength and your, your sufficiency might be manifested in our lives, Lord God, but that the power and the excellency of the power would come from you, Lord, and that all of the glory would go to you. Lord, we thank you for that this morning. We pray your blessing on your people, on this church, Lord God. Seal your people, seal this word, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Bring us back again safely next week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you, Pastor Dave. Good word this morning. Getting the whole hearing on. And you're leaving when for Africa? Wednesday. 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 Okay.